A man named James Gurney once said, We were too broke for hotels, so we slept in graveyards and underpasses, and we sketched gravestone cutters, lumberjacks, and ex-cons. To make enough money for food, we drew $2 portraits in bars by the light of cigarette machines. <laughs> James Gurney is the author of Dinotopia books, uh, books like Imaginary Realism and Color and Light, legendary illustrator and adventurer. He's traveled the world, worked for National Geographic, painted sets for an animated film called Fire and Ice, and he's brushed shoulders with everyone from Frank Frazetta to hobos and freight cars. Steve and I are delighted and indeed honored to welcome Mr. James Gurney to our Artist Spotlight series. Welcome, Mr. Gurney. Thank you, Marty and Steve. I'm honored to be on your program, and uh, Steve, love for the mind of watercolor and uh, the interviews you've done, Marty, so it's good to be with both you guys. Oh, thanks a lot. That's really that. <laughs> yeah, pretty kind of you. And we should explain to the viewers that uh, the visual you have of me now, you'll only have for the first five minutes because I don't have enough of an internet connection for a real streaming call. But hopefully the quality will be better because I'm recording to uh, high quality audio. And uh, anyway, so you get to look at the studio for five minutes and then we'll just go to what I think is more interesting than my face would be artwork and maybe some process painting shots. Yes, yes. Well, it's great. We, we appreciate uh, what you're doing here and the footage, however you get it. But we will show lots of stuff uh, that you've done. I'm going to kick off with a, a kind of a general question about art. Uh, you once said that there's no line between fine art and illustration. There's no high or low art. There's only art. And it comes in many forms. Totally agree. It seems like a pretty straightforward uh, comment, but do you have anything to add to that or expand on for that? Yeah, I mean, I do think that uh, illustration is in many ways the highest and least commercial calling, especially the kind of illustration that I grew up loving as a kid, and that's the golden age, Howard Pyle and N.C. Wyeth. And back in those days, uh, the artists were carrying on the tradition of history painting, which was the fine art of the 19th century that I also admired. Uh, and even into the late 20th century, when I started working as an illustrator, uh, paperback covers, National Geographic illustrations, what you're doing there are uh, pictures of history and archaeology, and there's nothing less commercial, kind of more enduring, more a higher calling, a higher challenge than doing that. So it's, it's all art, including comics and animation, a lot of the things that they didn't talk about in art school that I also loved uh, growing up as an artist. So it's, it's, I don't really recognize any barriers between illustration and fine art. It's a great point. Refreshing to hear, actually, for me. So just so the listeners and viewers know, we're going to bounce back and forth between art-related questions and some of questions of a more personal nature. And so let me hit you right off the bat with this one, James. A uh, little bit humorous, but maybe you can describe uh, the time in 1980, 40, year, 40 years ago now, uh, when you got arrested just outside of Dayton, Ohio. Well, I was uh, riding across country on a freight train with my friend Thomas Kincaid, and that was before he became the painter of light. He and I were, went all the way back to <clears throat> about 1977. We were assigned as roommates in college at UC Berkeley. Uh, where I went to college before going to art school and, and I met Tom there and we became buddies right away and uh, and at the time we were riding the freight trains we left uh, uh, our place in Los Angeles uh, left our girlfriends there and just jumped on the freight trains at the advice of a hobo that we met in the LA freight yards we were tired of of classrooms we wanted to ride the freights but to get to the point of what you asked uh, we were trying to fly a kite off the top of a a three-level auto carrier. I tied all my bootlaces together to make a kite string and found a piece of cardboard. Uh, and the guys in, in the caboose saw it and they radioed ahead to the Willard, Ohio Police Department, which we didn't know, but they, uh, they stopped the train, they kicked us off, and we had to find another way to hitch to New York City uh, after getting kicked off the freight trains. There was, a, there was a point where you were, at, you were, you were, uh, you were reading graffiti off the side of a like I think it was an on-ramp or uh, an overpass or something and you were trying to hitchhike and there was a bunch of graffiti written on on uh, on the um, maybe it was the barrier blockade but I was listening to the tape and you <laughs> you were reading and and one of the graffiti items said that uh, it was something like if you're if you're here 
I can't remember exactly what it was, James, but it's like if, if you're still here, you're 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 still alive or something like that, something to that effect. But you guys had to hitchhike, catch trains, do a lot of things to get across the country. You met a lot of characters. Yeah, there was, there was a real brotherhood of the the working guys. They didn't really call themselves hobos uh, or tramps. They were they were working guys that we met along the way, and they were real helpful to us because we didn't know how to ride freight trains. Turns out it's pretty dangerous to ride on an open flat car because you get kicked off by the the bulls when you get into the yards. Uh, so we learned how to ride inside box cars with open doors, making sure the doors didn't close on us. Um, but it was a great way to see the country because all through the Midwest, you're going through uh, the middle of the towns where the interstate is way off to the side somewhere. Um, and it's also a good metaphor for life because when you're riding the freight train, you don't really know whether your car is gonna get set out on a siding somewhere. You don't know necessarily where the destination of the train is gonna take you. So you're throwing your life into the hands of chance. And having an art career is kind of a lot like that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But yeah, that's, also an, that's an amazing. It's an education for us both about um, drawing and painting because, uh, you know, we were tired of, of being in art classrooms and having the smell of marker fumes and turpentine kind of get into our brains. We wanted to get outside and breathe real fresh air. And we were inspired by uh, Studs Terkel. Mar Marty, I know you love Studs Terkel as a, as a, yes. a public radio guy. And, uh, and Charles Kuralt and John Steinbeck, all of whom hit the road to kind of explore America. And we thought nobody's really done this with a sketchbook. So we decided to, you know, stay with gravestone cutters and lumbermen uh, and to just meet ordinary people uh, around uh, on our adventures and just talk to people. We, we were, one of our obsessions was to ask guys who had been married a long time, what's the secret to a happy marriage? And we got all kinds of interesting answers. And we'd, along the way, we'd sketch portraits of people in the wild. Yeah, you mentioned cool. uh, you mentioned one time, and Steve's got lots of questions, so I got to hurry up with mine. But you you had mentioned no, you're good. Go. You had mentioned one time that I think it was like a dog show, and people were particularly uh, finicky about the the way you portrayed their their pets. So uh, it was tough and a, and a really better critique than you'd get in any art class or art school. Yeah, that's really true. The uh, just asking ordinary people about something they know more about than you do if you're drawing it. Like if you're drawing a tractor, ask the guy that uses the tractor uh, and you'll learn a lot about it. And in the case of the dog show, we were in, staying in southern Missouri, in Missouri and we went to the annual coonhound uh, trials. So we rode around at dawn in the back of these guys' pickup trucks when they sent their coonhounds out. And um, at the end of the day, we would draw portraits of the dogs. And we thought it'd be pretty easy because we were used to drawing uh, for art school and getting the critique of the teacher, but they would, the teacher would usually talk about technique or values or your composition or something, but these guys would know exactly whether the ear was too long or too short or whether the spots were right or whether the eyes were in the right place. And uh, they gave us a real education about uh, how different people look at artwork in a different way. And it's, I think, really good for all of us to look through the eyes of an expert who knows something about the subject we're drawing. That's excellent. That's excellent. Your your uh, your focus there reminds me a little bit of uh, Mary White. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Yeah. Oh, I admire her greatly. Her, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Just but you're doing kind of in sketchbook form what she's doing in her pieces. You know, with the average working man or the average person. You know, sort of down there in the everyday life. Just absolutely yeah. love those stories that the art tells. Yeah, for those who don't know Mary White's work, uh, her last name is spelled W-H-Y-T-E, I think. And uh, I met her yes. at the portrait convention in Washington. And she's a fabulous artist who's traveled all around uh, painting ordinary people at their working jobs. And she does an amazing watercolor demo. I don't know if you've seen it, Steve, but she'll take uh, a shadow side of the face in blue, ultramarine, solid blue. And then she'll say, don't yes. worry, I'm going to yes. do something bold here. And then she'll drop some... Uh, burn sienna into that and it'll run into the the blue uh shadow side and just come out perfectly so yes. she's, she's and she can talk all the way through she's when she's doing it which is amazing too <laughs> yeah she's fabulous i have seen that demo it's it's amazing thank you for for mentioning more about her there um while we're talking about color uh i got a question it's kind of got several parts but it's basically with the same question 
in your book color and light which i absolutely love it's a bible for those subjects you mentioned that uh i really was intrigued towards the beginning of the book i think there's an important historical development uh in color uh, that color was better understood in relationship to other colors and no color exists in isolation but it's highly influenced by illumination or light surrounding colors or atmosphere love that statement uh, your work really seems to emphasize those ideas can you expand on that or how you've learned and studied reinforce these ideas in your own artistic development definitely and let me reach over here and click off the camera and we can switch over to show the book and to Paintings in Progress. Yeah, this is my Color and Light book. Thanks for mentioning it. Uh, I wanted to, in this book, deal with some of the big questions you're asking about the historical developments that led to our modern understanding of color. In the late uh, 18th century and the 19th century and, and to today, uh, scientists have kind of led our understanding of color. And back at the time of Isaac Newton, um, there was a really interesting debate going on that still kind of plays out in a painter's life now. Isaac Newton was interested in color as an optical phenomenon. He took, the, uh, he took a prism and took sunlight and showed that sunlight, the white sunlight, is made up of all the colors of the rainbow. And that when we look at a rainbow, we're looking at white light that's been scattered according to its wavelengths. Uh, so he formed the color wheel that we've come down to in various variations. Uh, and as he understood it, color was sort of an objective fact that existed out in the world. But at the same time, uh, Johann Goethe in Germany was interested in the, in the subjective effects of color through our visual perception. And he got interested in how we often see colors at the borders of bright light and shadow. And he was interested in after images. So when you look at a bright green patch and then look at a white surface after that you get a an after image it's the opposite color so the after image of green might be red or magenta the after image of blue might be orange or yellow so these are things that a lot of the impressionists started to become aware of in the late 19th century and it's influenced a lot of what we do as painters today understanding that you can mix colors of light uh, right in the eye by having adjacent colors next to each other on the canvas, uh, like in pointillism or just in offset printing, um, and that you can surround a color, as you suggested, Steve, uh, with uh, a complement of that color, and that'll enhance the effect of the color. So those are the three big areas, the science of optics, the science of visual perception, and then the science of pigments. That's what fantastic. what have you studied specifically, or what do you do that, that helps you reinforce these ideas or, or continues your discovery? Well, the way I've tried to learn more about this is first by unlearning a lot of the stuff that I learned in art school, because a lot of the stuff in art school was based on um, Albers and some of the color theorists who really didn't have that much understanding of color and nature. And that was what always interested me is... Why are reflections slightly darker than the thing they're reflecting? And why do clouds get yellower or more orange as they go back in space? Does uh, a warmer color really advance? If so, how come the sun can be as an orange color far in the sky, can be the can re recede in the distance if it's uh, 93 million miles away and a bright orange? So I started to question a lot of the dogma that I, I heard in art school and went back to painting manuals from the 19th century where they take for granted that artists wanted to paint realistic scenes of what's around them. And so they analyzed a lot of backyard science of reflections and refraction uh, and the properties of light and atmospheric perspective. You know, what changes in color as it goes back in space? All that stuff is very necessary to understand if you're going to paint something believably and achieve some atmosphere. Uh, and then the other thing is to understand more about the new science of visual perception. And this has happened recently as we've developed technology for scanning activity in the brain. You can tell what part of the brain is active when you look at a face. Uh, you can see uh, what part of your brain is active when you're hearing a sound. And one of the things that these scientists have discovered is that 
understanding light and dark values and detecting movement is processed in a different part of the brain than, than color, uh, which is a whole different section of the brain. Yeah, I, I really love uh, your focus and a lot of your videos on limited palettes, something I'm trying to move uh, more to. I get so many questions about color, and it's usually tell me specifically what colors I should be using. And uh, it's just, you know, it, there's so much, it seems like, that needs to come before that in value, but also in how to use a limited number of colors. Yeah, exactly. A lot of students want to know what colors to use, what colors to choose from the art store. It's like a candy store. You see all these different kinds of yellow, yellow ochre and Hansa yellow and Aralide yellow and cadmium yellow. And which one do I need? Just tell me the ingredients. And what I advise people is start with a very simple set. In fact, the simplest set is just black and white. You can learn value that way and you can learn paint, texture, paint mixing, how it behaves with water, if you're using a water medium. And once you get the hang of painting in black and white, then you can introduce black, white, and a color, like the Zorn palette. And, um, and then later on, you can introduce a triadic color um, using three different colors plus white, uh, and changing that set of colors each time gives you a different menu, a different set of options, and you really learn what each pigment will do that way. So that's one of the things I'm going to be doing on my next tutorial, which will be on Color and Practice, uh, Volume 2, which will be about triads, uh, to kind of take us into that realm. Because one of the things I've learned about color is that it's not a matter of what colors you choose to include in your uh, composition, but which colors you leave out. One of the biggest problems I had as a young painter was the uh, the whole problem of the fruit salad disease where I had too many colors in each picture. I've learned so much and I've uh, uh, spent a lot of money on Gumroad, uh, sir. So thank you for that, James. Thank you. Um, uh, also, yes. well, I just wanted to ask you, you know, again, turning this a little bit more personal. Um, the first time I saw a video with you and Jeanette and, it, and um, her sketching with you, it reminded me of Edward Hopper and Josephine, although most of her work is lost to history. I went down a rabbit you know, trail and, and looked at, uh, at Jeanette's work, and it is in itself outstanding. And I, I'm wondering from your standpoint, how does her work inform yours and vice versa? You guys have been together for so long. I, it's, it's amazing to see you work together and, and sit in a cafe and, and have conversation. You're like, you could finish each other's sentences. You, you, you know each other so well. How, how do you keep that fresh? You know, how does it inform your work? How do you inform each other's work? How, how does that relationship, I don't know, make, make you better, James and, and her? Oh, well, that's a good question, and uh, and thank you for asking it. We're we definitely uh, inspire each other, and she, in fact, inspired me to really take up watercolor. I was started out really entirely as an oil painter, and uh, she always worked in watercolor. And whenever we go out, we like similar subjects to paint, but she'll approach them differently. Usually with a lighter palette, and she'll usually work vertically, where where I'll tend to work horizontally, um, and. Uh, she is uh, really good with the quick sketches of people, and I always admire looking at how she does that. So uh, we're not competitive with each other. She's not interested in showing her work on social media. She has no career ambitions. She just loves to paint outside. So that's how we first met, and we were sketching buddies in art school for a couple of years before we got more serious. So we really are, are used to each other, and uh, we both understand when we're traveling that when you pull off beside a road that it might be three hours before you get back in the car and drive on again. And, and we both know we're both in the same mindset uh, on that score. There's an old photo. I imagine there's a lot of, oh, go ahead. Steve. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, Martin. no, no. Go oh, ahead. I was just going to say, I imagine there's a lot of energy that you gain from working together, painting with somebody, uh, especially your wife. Oh yeah. And I think there, there are probably a lot of uh, husband, wife, artist uh, duos who go out together um, uh, Paul and Tia Cratter is one I can think of right off the bat. Um, and, um, you know, and, and it's, it's great because, uh, it, it kind of goes without saying that you, you are interested in different things 
when it comes to actually doing the painting. And it's really interesting for us to compare notes after the end of the painting session when mine were, are, tend to be more moody or spooky or depressing, and she tends to do things that are more cheerful and uh, upbeat and light. And, <laughs> and uh, we're looking at the same thing. And it kind of, she also is more interested in line, and I'm more interested in tone. And it's not just, this is something we ask ourselves sometimes, is this just a style thing, the way we've learned to use a style? Or do we actually see differently? I mean, there's no way to really know if you see the world in the same way that someone else does. We all know artists tend to see things a little differently from non-artists. Um, but among artists, um, do some people see lines uh, and, uh, and gesture more than other people? And I think the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Part of it is training, but part of it is just uh, the way our, our perceptual systems work. But there's no way to know mm. for sure until we can get a complete brain scan. Well, and it, wow, seem, it seems like uh, when I was listening to you talk uh, or, or reading an interview that you gave once about how you two met in art school and you were out, like you were together for four hours at a time getting to know each other. Uh, and just over the years, how you've cultivated that and just looking at the way it's informed your work and her work it what what's rubbed off on you though i'm i'm really interested in getting to the heart of that like like what does Jeanette do that you look over and say you know what i i think i want to do that apart from just the whole media change to watercolor have you noticed things about her work or you think she's noticed about you that you know is inevitable to to cross pollinate there yeah well she's influenced me a lot more than i've influenced her i've always tried to talk her into uh gouache or opaques I can't get her to paint in oil. She doesn't like oil. And even gouache, she doesn't, she'd rather not use opaques. Uh, and um, for me, working in tra fully in transparent, which I've done some paintings, but not that many, I usually like to lean, lean on the white uh, accents here and there and tints. But uh, she'll do a whole painting with a ballpoint pen and transparent watercolor. And it's good for me to be pulled mm. in that direction because I think I tend to be more big, chunky, tonal, you know, dark values. Uh, sometimes I'll put in a real dark passage right at the beginning, and that horrifies her because she likes to work her way slowly down to darks. And there are a mm. lot of uh, painters, uh, like the British watercolor painters and the botanical illustrators and, and uh, botanical artists who work in, in a slightly more indirect way than I usually do, uh, where instead of trying to hit the value you want right away, you work your way slowly to it. And uh, yep, I really yep. admire people who do that. Yeah. Um, you know, both are really careful painters, but also people like Turner, who who could um, do very quick uh, impressions using purely transparent color. Um, mm -hmm. Some it takes of my a lot favorite of watercolor painters. Yeah, it takes tremendous patience and and the ability to plan. I think the 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 most difficult media in some ways are transparent watercolor. And uh, linoleum block printing, where you're you're going through, or, or woodcut prints, where you're going through a lot of stages mm -hmm. to get to your final look. Well, if you get a chance, uh, uh, James, I ask you a favor. Please tell Jeanette that I I love her work. I appreciate what she does. I when I get a glimpse of it in the in the video here and there, when I've been able to look at it on your blog, I I think it's just simply wonderful and. And it does have a cheerful nature to it, and it's it's um, it's astonishingly complementary to your work, and yet it stands on its own. Like I would definitely go to a James and Jeanette Gurney art show, <laughs> you know, or just a Jeanette, uh, you know, art show for sure. So please tell her that, you know, oh, there's people you. out there that really appreciate her work. Oh, that's really kind of you. That'll make her day, and and I'll tell her that. And a lot of people ask her to share her work more. But she just doesn't. She's not interested in putting it out there on social media. I, I applaud her for that. I think it's uh, admirable to, to to hold back from doing that. It makes you crazy sometimes. Well, in an age where everybody's <laughs> got to post a doodle, you know, it's uh, it, and and nothing against that. I love seeing it all, and I'm I'm glad the world is rich richer with it now than it ever was. But um, yes, it it can be maddening for sure. Uh, Steve, you speaking <laughs> of plain air painting, um, I. And I should say right off the bat, Steve, that uh, uh, that you were the one who told me about James Gurney. Like I was, the man yes. was invisible yes. to me for fifty-five years of my life, and I count that as all unfortunate years um, because yeah. I didn't know James Gurney, and I got to know him over this past yeah. month. But you're the one who told me about him, and when you did that, you you said, "Hey, you know, I've been doing a lot of 
well, some significant amount of plain air painting, you need to watch this guy. You need to look at what he's doing. And, and yeah, I think Steve yeah. was really compelled by your, your plain air. Yeah, I, uh, I'm pretty new to plein air, actually. Uh, my 35-year uh, career in design and illustration was almost strictly studio. And, uh, you know, I feel like I'm just uh, a kid in school now. Uh, since starting my YouTube channel, I, I decided to start doing it. And I, you know, I, I still haven't even completely decided on what my, my go pack is, is like. I've tried several different things. <laughs> well, but, James has got uh, some you're, videos you're, on that, uh, Steve, if you want to yeah. check those out. Well, you know, and what's interesting is I've, I only ever knew you, James, as the Dinotopia guy, uh, until uh recent years and until i started seeing your videos i thought oh this is the guy that did dinotopia and you were starting to do all this well not starting but i was starting to see all of your your plein air work and it's like oh my goodness so this is is telling me and showing me things i've never seen before and how to do it things i can approach subjects and it always wows me uh and kind of, uh, and not kind of, it does inspire me. Not just your skill, but your willingness to tackle any subject, uh, even mundane ones that would be passed over by a lot of other people. Um, in your videos, you've mentioned everything from light and mood and composition and other intriguing elements. Uh, talk about that for a minute. Uh, is it a collection of all of those elements? Or do you have one focus mainly when you pick a subject? What attracts you to a scene? Well, okay, thanks. There's a lot of good questions in there. Um, <laughs> when I started plein air painting, I was really just a kid, and nobody, at least I never heard that term for a long time after that. Um, I was, I call it on-the-spot sketching or uh, drawing on location. And when I met Tom Kincaid, we became obsessed with sketching and painting outdoors. Um, and nobody else was really doing it that we could find. There was one book um, uh, on on the on the spot sketching that had Frank McMahon and some of the reportorial sketch artists of the day. But we were also interested in you know Andrew Wyeth, and then going back to the sketch artists for the newspapers around 1910 or so like Frederick Gruger, some of the people, before photography was really easy to print in newspapers, there were a lot of sketch artists from that era that we really admired. Um, and anyway, we we were like the only ones at our art school who were interested in this, and, and that's what led to that freight train trip, which was just going to be a summer excursion across America. But we were sketching the whole way, wanting to uh, write a book about it. That was the idea we had. And we, when we got to New York City, there was one publisher, Watson Guptill, that seemed like a natural place to bring this idea. And uh, we were just two guys wearing uniform shirts uh, coming out of nowhere, and we were just 20, 21 years old. Uh, and they thought we were completely crazy. Um, but we had all these sketchbooks filled with um, sketches that we had done across America. And that, it didn't, we didn't get the contract right away. It took a lot more presentations and a lot of thinking through how we're going to arrange this topic. But we ended up writing a book that was published back in 1982 called The Artist's Guide to Sketching. And it, this is before urban sketching and before long before plein air painting and before all that, anybody was doing anything like that. Um, but it was something we felt that sketching doesn't have to be loose and uh, indifferent. It could be a very careful nature study. It could be an imaginative study that you do where you transform objects or anthropomorphize things. Uh, and the, the, it's both a proving ground for your studio work and a way of gathering information, uh, but it's also just a way of engaging with the world and having adventures. That, uh, cool. just, just, a, just a note on the book, The Artist's Guide to Sketching, it's currently, um, if you want a signed copy that's been signed by both James Gurney and Thomas Kincaid, you can fork over $3,373.77 US cents if you want that book on eBay right now. It's listed. Um, I went and checked that out. You can get the unsigned version uh, for quite a bit less, but still uh, not a cheap book because it's out of publication. Um, I have been bidding on several copies lately, James. <laughs> so um, just, just so you know, I wish that money went to you, my friend. But uh, 
in some that's okay in some way or fashion uh, it'll get passed down hey you you had briefly mentioned um thomas there and i i wanted to say um and this is very personal but i read some moving words by windsor kincaid uh she came to visit you and jeanette recently and you guys um she talked about how it felt to miss her dad and how at home she felt with the two of you um, when she was visiting, what kind of memories did did that stir up for you? What kind of emotions uh, did you did you feel about that? I know you lost your friend Thomas several years ago, and um, it probably hasn't been very easy uh, that situation. But when Windsor was there, how how did you feel? How how did that situation? Yeah, how was it? To oh, be Windsor. Yeah, no, thanks for asking. Windsor is one of uh, Tom's four daughters, and. Uh, and Tom's widow, Nanette Kincaid, um, is a, still a great friend of ours. And uh, it, was, it was tough to lose Tom. I didn't know him as, as, I mean, I was always friendly with him. And we would go occasionally out on f- family trips together with our family and his family uh, in the later years after he started the, the painter, Painters of Light um, print business. But when I knew him, it was a much earlier phase before he was married and before he had kids. And so, uh, so that was kind of the wild bohemian years of, of Kincaid. And he was doing, um, and, and we were kind of connecting his daughter Windsor with the early memories of Tom when he was uh, always doing, and I guess he always did this through his whole life, but he had a, a, an amazing ability to draw bizarre caricatures and sketching games where, you know, the kind of thing where you hand a, a drawing off to the person next to you and they work on it for a while and you know, just art as a as a way of having fun with with other folks. Uh, so we were telling Windsor some early stories of our adventures going across America, and uh, you know, like one time we were um, sketching in Buffalo, New York, and and there was a place where there was uh, an ore freighter that was we wanted to do a sketch of. So we went out on this bridge and set up our chairs. And started sketching this ore freighter, and then we didn't know at the time that it was a uh, a drawbridge. Fortunately, not the kind that tipped up, but the whole middle section lifted up. And the guy in the in the booth above us, he didn't notice we were there at first. And the bridge started moving, and all these bells and lights were going off. And this whole section that we were sitting on went up higher and higher. So we did another sketch from higher up. Um, but, but you never know what's gonna what's gonna happen. Uh, we've uh, been. Uh, you know, had easels blown down in high wind and uh, times when we were kicked out by a guard or a harbor master or a cop or uh, I got kicked out of a, a sketching venue by a nun one time. Uh, so we, we've had all the adventures you could want. <laughs> but that, that, that just, just reading her short blog post about the time she was with you there, I think it was, well, I'm not sure exactly, but it was, it was, it was recently and how uh, how at home she felt with you, which was wonderful. And even Nanette's memories of the times you guys spent together, very personal, but very, very poignant, very moving. And I think Windsor Kincaid is pretty young, uh, but they were words filled she with is. wisdom. Yeah. yeah, and she's carrying on the tradition of being an artist. And, you know, she's, like a lot of us are, trying to reconstruct some of our ancestors who came before at different stages of their life. I mean, my both my grandfathers died before I was born, and so I never knew either of them. So I was really hungry when I was growing up, when I was her age, <clears throat> to try to find out more about them, what they were like, and what they thought was funny, and what they did in their spare time. And so I, I sought out my, um, my grandfather's uh, brothers, my great uncles, to ask them about about my my paternal grandfather and uh, and that was really it means a lot I think to kind of know where you come from and why you are the, the way you are I don't know if you guys ever had that experience also of trying to track down some per, the personality of your of people that came before you want to fill in the gaps because you know at some point you're standing on shoulders right you you you, yeah, didn't, yeah. you know that yeah. something about them is in you hey uh, one quick question and Steve's got some important. Emil Zola questions for you, which are good. Um, I'm looking forward to that. But one one thing about you, James, that that strikes me, and I think lots of other folks, is that you have a, a childlike fascination or curiosity when it comes to to people. Um, when you did the sketch at the tire place, they were you you just had popped in there to get a tire fixed or whatnot. 
you you talked to those guys you 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 interviewed them almost in a in a reporter like fashion about what they did what what their work day was like you know the famous what's your day like <laughs> you know the line um but, yeah but you you have that sort of childlike curiosity and the world hasn't uh, maybe beat you down or made you as cynical as, as, as some others our age. But tell tell me a little bit about what, what or uh, us about what what is it in you that you believe keeps that curiosity fed, alive, inspired, those kind of things. Great okay, question. Yeah, well, I, I think I'm, I admire a lot of reporters like you and, and people who are professional, curious people asking other people for their story. And I think, was it Thoreau or someone like that? Maybe it was Emerson who said that everyone's an expert in something that you're not, and you can learn something from every person. And that's especially mm. true when you're outside sitting on a chair, drawing a picture of a horse and a, and a person who knows something about horses comes up and talks to you about not only how to fix your drawing, but, but what's the story behind this horse and, and how it mm. was, uh, how it was raised and why it looks the way it does. And, I think when you're drawing or painting something, you're showing an interest in it, and that automatically brings people out to tell you the story of of, of what you're doing. I, I even have a little sign that says, hmm. tell me about this place, just to cue people into sharing uh, something. Uh, but but I don't even need that a, sign because people do this anyway. What and, a great uh, idea, though. When Jeanette and I were first married, we took a trip to England where we purposely didn't bring a camera, and instead we just brought... At the time, it was a Sony Walkman, professional Walkman tape recorder to record audio sounds, and then a pencil sketchbook. So we had pencil and wash and, and gray wash and sound as our only way to record things. So if we saw uh, a statue that interested us, we had to draw the picture of it. There was no other way we could bring that home. And while we were sitting there, I'd run the tape recorder and record the sound of the horses going by in the cobblestone streets. Uh, or the uh, or the the sound of the Cockney accents in London, and um, it was it's really evocative when you put those ba back together again later to combine visuals and audio. In fact, I played with an, creating an app. My son, uh, who's an app developer, we only did, did a couple of these, but we call it the Living Sketchbook, where you combine uh, a high res scan, a scalable scan of an image. Yes. along with the sounds that were recorded um, of that place. So it immerses you in that location. Uh, there's a little bit where I talk about the painting and how it's made. You can also include video in there. So it's a nice format uh, yep. to to kind of bring a sketchbook alive. Yeah, I have one of them. <laughs> very much, very, very much like uh, the stuff that I believe um, your son Daniel uh, has worked on the Living Sketchbook ad, app. It's kind of is that Dan? Is yeah. that Dan's work? Your your son is that right? Yeah, that's our son Dan. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, he lives in Dublin, Ireland now, and he's uh -huh. uh, he's doing app programming. He's a little too busy for me to get him to do much more work on that, but <laughs> he's uh, he helped out with that. Well, he's a and uh, I know you guys probably like me as kid. When I was a kid, I grew up on old radio. Yeah, uh, there was a radio mm. station in San Francisco, KSFO, that played uh, Suspense and Lights Out and Lone Ranger sure. and yeah. uh, Jack Benny and all the comedy stuff. And you know that was all from a little before my time, but they were playing it at the time I was growing up. And I had a shortwave radio too that I would listen to, and I loved all, <laughs> just pure radio, just the pure soundscape of yeah. hg wells yeah. doing war of the worlds to me it's i like movies too but i to me pure audio is the ultimate form of imagination theater of the yeah. mind yeah theater of the mind for sure well it's good i think we got closer but i there you what you have that ability that innate curiosity is is somewhat unique i you don't see it in generally um yeah well well not i shouldn't say but i artists can tend to be introverts. You know, I go out in large sketching groups and do plein air stuff, and lots of folks, they're just quiet. They just want to go and, and paint, and it's a it's a it's a it's an isolate it's a um a solitary endeavor for them. Whereas you, uh, what well James, I've I've heard you say that you have both the, uh, you know, people will walk up and ask you questions, and it's hard for you to both focus and respond to that person at the same time, and yet other times. You're very engaged with with the person in your subject matter. They they've entered a world, or you've entered their world, or somehow you're trying to intersect your two worlds to inform your painting. And I think that's a wonderful quality. 
It's awesome. Well, it's a survival strategy when I'm sketching because here's what I've learned is that if um, if a person comes up and says, are you an artist and are you going to sell that? I mean, that just takes you to the place of the ego, which is exactly what you have to get rid of if you want to really absorb yourself in the scene you're trying to record. So what I try to do is redirect the conversation around to getting them to talk about something that matters to them, especially something that, that I can see in the scene. Um, and so as long as they're talking and I'm just nodding my head once in a while, I can go back to putting 90% of my concentration on the painting. And um, I do love, you know, interviewing people full on where I'm giving them 100% concentration. Mm-hmm. But when I'm painting outside, mm-hmm. I can't give more than 10%. And the best way I've learned to do that is just to get them talking about something else besides me and my and why I'm doing this. You know what I mean? That's well, excellent. We do. That's excellent. I, I do know exactly what you mean. As a matter of fact, uh, I often uh, find myself going out to paint, and someone will walk up, and I won't return to my painting for an hour and a half yep. because I'm 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 having this conversation with them. I haven't learned um, quite how to uh, you know to, to do it the way you've done it, James. But I find it. I find it fascinating about your personality that you, and what you just said, what you just said is you you basically have to humble yourself to the moment and you're not, you have to remove your ego. And that, I think if, if artists were willing to do that, regardless of their success or just anybody in life, we might have a better planet. Um, Steve's got some great questions. I think one thing that, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. No, I think one thing that might be misleading about my YouTube channel is that it may seem to people that I'm, um, I'm thinking really clearly and being able to express exactly what I'm doing at each stage of the painting. But in truth, um, a lot of what you hear as a voiceover, I do after the fact where I try to reconstruct my mental process back in the studio when I'm recording the soundtrack. Um, When I'm actually on location, to be honest, um, my brain is just kind of a, a muddy mess of conflicting thoughts and doubts and and if I were to try to talk while I was painting and narrate my process, I don't think it would be very coherent. Um, Boy, because, I'm glad to hear you say that. <laughs> because, you know, and I know you've, you've been good at doing that, Steve, and talking while you paint, but it's, it's probably, uh, it's difficult for me anyway when I'm doing something really complicated like painting reflections in a store window and you're trying to resolve two different worlds in the reflection and yeah. what you're seeing. And it it's just, difficult, it, yeah, it it's difficult. I mean, sometimes I can just because I, I had an idea before I started painting of what I wanted to communicate. But uh, nine times out of ten, I, I, I do a voiceover just for the very reasons you stated. Uh, I'm able to go back and talk about it in different ways and, uh, you know, reconstruct the ideas that I had or come up with completely different thoughts that I think would be useful. But I'm, I really am glad to hear you say that because you're right. Your your videos, uh, you know, they they present a nice, clear uh, progression of thought and um, you know step by step sort of look to what you're doing. So I think that's important uh, information for people to hear. Yeah, for some of the listeners or viewers who are interested in doing their own videos, um, I just want to mention that what I did when I was starting out doing my YouTube channel. Uh, was to ask people on a blog post, what are some of your pet peeves about art videos, art process videos, and what things um, do you like to see in them? And uh, I got a lot of feedback, and I can give you the link to that blog post because it's the comments afterwards. There must be about 80 or 100 comments of people. Like someone said, you know, show your palette, show what you're looking at, really basic things. Uh, Go ahead and do time-lapse but uh, don't play music under the time lapse if you can help it. I'd rather hear the sound of the environment. Uh, someone said, you know, if you want to have the camera looking back at your face, just keep it short. <laughs> you know, we don't want to look at your face. We want to look at your painting. And I took yeah, that to heart. Yeah. And, um, and people on, uh, on YouTube comments often give me a lot of suggestions that really help me to be a better YouTuber and to make better videos. And oh, I love the fact that you get that feedback uh, and analytics, you can really see if there's a place in the video where you lost people uh, and they ch- tuned out. You can definitely mm. see it in the charts they give you. And the blog That's is true. is Gurney Journey. I should mention that if you want to go out and check that out. It's a blog spot. I think it's on Blogspot. Um, oh. But if you just search up James Gurney, you're going to get an entire um, Google page full of interesting uh, places to visit. Um, 
set aside mm. uh, perhaps mm-hmm. one to two months of your life and immerse yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead, Steve. You had a meal, uh, Zola, uh, Zola question. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because uh, I was looking at uh, you had a video on painting a supermarket entrance. Uh, a grocery store entrance. Oh, God, I love that. I almost... I showed that to I my almost, wife, Steve. Yeah. I showed that to my wife, and she yeah. said, you know, my wife is very encouraging, but she's from Northern Ireland, so she doesn't mince <laughs> words. Um, she said, well, <laughs> Martin, why don't you paint like that? Let me... Well... <laughs> I said, well, uh, yeah, that I wish I could, you know, but but she was even <laughs> amazed by about that, that supermarket yeah. entrance uh, painting. Uh, yeah, I almost... I almost passed that video up because I thought, okay, I, I love your work, but I don't think this was something I would have painted. I'm so glad that I didn't uh, towards the end of that video. I mean, and it, it was just a, a wonderful painting. Uh, but towards the end of the video, you uh, threw in this quote by Emile Zola. That was worth the price of admission right there. And I'm paraphrasing, but it's something to the effect that imagery of the past is a cemetery of illusion and gravestones that we stub our toes on. You can give me the correct quote. But the modern world opens up visual possibilities that our ancestors never dreamed of. Man, I want to tell you, I, that was so thought-provoking. I thought about that quote the rest of the day. Can you talk about that? Sure. And no, how it influences your work? Well, for the people who, I guess you'll show this video on uh, on the visuals here. Um, that doorway is something that we see that kind of doorway to big box stores all the time. And the hardest thing for me is not the painting of it. It's recognizing it as something that's worth painting or possible to paint. And to think, to stop and stand there and think, okay, what, first of all, what do I got to do with the perspective? And what about, uh, when do I, when should I paint exactly. those? gray uh, aluminum bars and uh, and how shall I approach this and to me it was something I'd never there was no precedent for people painting supermarket doors so I couldn't really think of you know how so and so might have painted this before. sure sure um, I mean someone like Hopper was was Edward Hopper was um, yes. breaking a lot of new ground and, and Andrew oh. was as well yeah um, but um, let's see my, my uh, recording is blowing out here a little bit so I might not have good quality audio for the whole time here anyway um, um, anyway uh, so it's a matter of finding these subjects and I think it's almost like discovering an unexplored continent um, our common world of parking lots and uh, alleyways and uh, and supermarkets and things like that that we see every day but we sort of tune them out in our day to day life and if, if you know I, I had one experience where I was going into the supermarket with my wife Jeanette and I saw the um, orange and lemon display in this in the market and I thought gee this, this would make a great painting uh, but I have my paints with me but uh, there's no way they'll let me set up an easel but I just did anyway I, I set up my tripod easel inside a shopping cart next to the apple display and uh, got to work on it. And I was wearing a uniform shirt, so I looked official, sort of. Yeah. And I think as a result of that, nobody bothered me at all. And I um, I ended up doing maybe about a 40-minute or 50-minute painting uh, of this scene. And I thought that the manager would come over and shut me down. Nobody said a word to me, not customers, not staff. But I realized later, I talked to somebody who worked in a market, and he said, well, if you're wearing a, a uniform, you can basically get away with anything in a supermarket because there's so many restockers from the different Pepperidge Farm or whatever company uh, that are in there that, that they, they, if you look serious and bu- business-like, they'll let you do what you're doing. What's amazing yeah. is that is that you went to the supermarket to get something, and Jeanette, you, she was, you told her, "Oh, I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes here painting lemons," <laughs> and she said, oh, "She's just like, okay, no, no worries, I'll, I'll go do yeah. something else, I guess." I, I don't no, no, she she takes about 52 minutes to do the shopping uh, run, and so I have to finish up in that much time. If I sit, spend any longer. You know the the chicken's going to start thawing out. Now. <laughs> She'll be un, unhappy. That's great. That's excellent. Yeah, and and I you know back to subject. Uh, we're talking about. I mean, well, I'm thinking uh, after I kind of get into what you're painting, there's a lot of abstraction there um, of light and shadow and mood, and uh, then it it does become really really interesting, and it kind of transcends. 
the subject matter itself. I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I wonder if that's what you're thinking. I mean, you painted a pile of snow from your car, uh, but it was it was wonderful just to see the the no tans of of dark and light, and then all the other more intricate uh, moods and values. Well, the way I paint in gouache, and gouache lets you do this, as you know, is to sometimes to find it in the paint and to go in really crazy and loose without a real definite plan and do your measurements and your perspective and your and your line work later in the game. Uh, I did in that one too. And that's why the painting looks so horrible halfway through. And probably a lot of people thought this guy is, is way out of control. And I, and I honestly felt like I, there was only a 50% chance I could ever finish this <laughs> one. Uh, a lot of my paintings are like that when I, when I use that approach. Uh, sometimes I do a real careful drawing and work um, mm. systematically from a known start and, and a carefully measured beginning. Uh, but other times I go in loose and, and wild, and that was definitely the latter case in that, in that case. Throw caution to the wind. You, you painted the, the yellow house by, the, um, by a, a, a road, and there was a car covered on it. And the, the thing that struck me about that, that painting, um, and maybe you didn't do this intentionally, but the trash can out front, the blue trash can, you, you painted that in a way that was uh, both uh, expert and um, just fascinating. I just zoomed in on that trash can because it was like, how did he get the light right on that? I just, you know, it's fascinating to to look at other artists and their how they see things and, and how they do it. But but even that, that mundane little object in front of the house was was well uh, well executed because you pointed out that you have, um, you know, sometimes you're very careful about your drawings. And I, I wondered if, if that was intentional or, uh, you know, as Bob Ross used to say, was that a happy accident? Well, it's uh, a matter of trying to discard detail that you don't really need as quickly as possible. And uh, when you compare something like that to a photograph of the same scene, it's amazing to me how much information gets left out of, a, of any painting, even one that you try to be detailed on. Uh, and I think that's why we like to look at paintings is that they look, they, they may look realistic, but really they're, if, especially if they're done on location and under pressure, um, there's a, a lot of information that you're leaving out. And that's what, <clears throat> what of course, our, our visual systems do as well. We actually don't get much data from our nerve, um, our optic nerve to our optical cortex. There's really not that much information at all coming coming down that pipe. Um, it's not like a 1080p uh, video feed or something. What happens is our brain elaborates on the, the little bits of information we do get from our eyes uh, according to our preconceived ideas of what things should look like. That's why optical illusions work so well on us uh, and uh, and why we're we're so easily fooled by things. So we're we're really completing detail in our mind, not in our eye. Um, and 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 that's one of the discoveries of this fairly recent discoveries of uh, uh, vision science that I think really fascinates me because um, that's what we do when we're painting too. We're we kind of taking these little cues and we're filling them out. We're making brush textures for grass and leaves and things. And um, hopefully, if it works, the viewer is going to construct this back together in their own imaginations. Well, we've only got 10 minutes or so left, so I want to move ahead since we've got some questions. We'll skip a few, but I want to take you back to Palo Alto, uh, Elwood P. Cubberly, the, the Cougars, class of 1976. You were a young man then, and you had a high school arts teacher named Bill Burns. Um I believe I've got his name right. T correct me if I know. You're right, changed. absolutely. You're doing your research. And yep. <laughs> he was a he was a good, uh, really good graphic arts teacher and a World War II veteran. Tell me, you know, at that early stage, what his influence meant to you. You know, your dad was an engineer. You had a different sort of home life. You didn't have artists. You've mentioned that a lot. But what what did Bill Burns mean to you, and how did he influence you? Maybe in a way that you haven't spoken about in the past. Okay. Yeah. I. I had, just to back up a little bit, I, in 8th grade and 7th grade, I had taken regular art classes, but they didn't seem to me um, focused in the way I was hoping for, because I was, look, I was working out of these old art instruction books and cartooning books. 
And there were, I discovered instead of the fine art classes at my high school, I discovered the graphic arts class. There were really two teachers. There was Bill Burns, who, like you say, he was a World War II, he was a photographer who would fly on missions uh, over Germany, and he would take, he would be in charge of taking the detailed photographs of the ground. So he had very little film, and he wanted to make every piece of film count. So he really emphasized the importance of preparing your, knowing your equipment, getting, being prepared, and getting the best result with every shot you had. Um, the and and he was the one who gave me, loaned me his animation stand and his animation camera, and and let me play with that and try out animation. Uh, which uh, I I got to just go in the back room and do that on my own. It wasn't anything they taught in the school. The other guy was a teacher named Bill Goggins, who um, was a kind of a crazy cartoonist who just did these really fun cartoons, was more like a hippie and like a really opposite type of person from Bill Burns. But the two of those guys and their enthusiasm for printed art and reaching an audience through um, the press you know, doing an illustration combined with type, printing out the school newsletter and sending it out there. That I love that whole idea of uh, working toward printed work and distributing printed images of, of my work. And that's probably why I was attracted to being an illustrator. So when I got to be a senior in high school, I asked my, my parents, I said, I, I want to go straight to art school. And they said, well, you could do that, but you might be wise to just take... Um, four years, go to college, study a little of everything, uh, and then go to art school and uh-huh. specialize. Because you can always specialize, but what you'll never get another chance to do is to study a little bit of everything. And that's probably where that maybe that curiosity comes from, is that I really love that period of, of college years of studying archaeology and astronomy and biology and psychology and just the introductory classes to each one of those courses. Um, so I really owe a lot to those teachers that I had who encouraged me to just be open to to learning a little bit about a, a lot of things. Thank you for taking us yeah. back there. I, I, I liked Bill Burns when you were talking about him, and I've never met the man. Yeah, he was a good guy. There's amazing teachers who are so devoted to inspiring kids and at the high school level and junior high school level that's when you can really make a difference in people's lives i think well now i'm going to have to look up uh cool did you say his name was bill goggins goggins yeah yeah goggins i'll have to look him up now uh steve you had a question on mixed media and then i have one last question for james actually i want to actually i'm going to skip to my last question because since we're out of time um and it's just a curiosity question, really, for me. I know a lot of your Dinotopia work was done in oils. Is this a medium you still use extensively, or have you moved on from that primarily to other mediums now? Obviously, you know, watercolor and gouache, but uh, what are you doing, if anything, in oils now? Well, um, well, as far as using oil, I put the camera back on so we can finish up the conversation with the video. Um, I do use oil for uh, my published illustrations, which I do for Scientific American, uh, Ranger Rick magazine, um, okay. mainly dinosaur illustrations, because when I'm working in the studio, I really like oil for its ability to control value and mm-hmm. to um, to really get really well-controlled values that don't shift when they dry. But I also do finished illustrations okay. in casein and gouache and, uh, and watercolor. Um, one of the reasons I use oil a little bit less in the studio is that mm-hmm. I'm, I've gotten a little sensitive to the uh, mineral spirits okay. and the solvents. And so I, I can use it, yeah, but not sure. as much because it, it messes up my skin and it makes me feel kind of dizzy more than it used to when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love oil and I still, I still love it. But I, I also love water medium yeah. just as much. Um. Well, we don't have much time uh, left, but James, will you let us, will you hate us if we steal five extra minutes from you? Because we've got some important questions to wrap up with. Sure. You know, go ahead. That, let's do it. All right. Well, you once did a, uh, a, a sketch or a painting of a colossal Mario, and it reminded me so much of The Giant by N.C. Wyeth. And I read maybe that he was a favorite artist of yours. I think you, you mentioned him earlier. And then it made me think about other artists that might inspire or inform you or more contemporaries. And I went looking and, you know, I know about Greg Manchez and he's written a 
written and illustrated a book called Above the Timberline. And I thought of your two styles, and they're similar. Have, do you know Greg Manchester? Do you guys talk? Uh, what do you think of his? Oh work? yeah, Greg's a friend of mine, and we we met at Illustration Masterclass, which was a a group in uh, Massachusetts who meet every summer to do illustrations or paintings from the imagination. There's a team that teaches that class, but he's also real old school like I am. Uh, and as far as and he did a wonderful book called Above the Timberline, uh, that's an illustrated book in the same, similar spirit of Dinotopia. Um, my inspiration for Dinotopia came from someone who came before me, which was uh, Reen Portfleet, the Dutch illustrator who did gnomes and uh, Noah's Ark and uh, The Living Forest and a book on dogs and horses. And also Brian Froud and uh, Alan Lee, who did fairies. And the, the idea with those books was to do a full length book for adults, not for kids, but an illustrated book that is for uh, a, f a wide ranging audience. It includes adults. And uh, I think they really broke the ground for the kind of book that Dinotopia was. For people who aren't familiar with Dinotopia, it's a series of books that I wrote and illustrated. They're about 160 pages long that follow the adventures of a father and a son who are shipwrecked on this island where dinosaurs are still alive. So we follow their adventures through Arthur Dennison's sketchbooks as he documents the cities and the uh, architecture and all the mechanics that he finds in this world. So they were massive projects that took me all through the 90s. Yeah, it's wonderful. And I was... Uh... I was going to mention Dinotopia as well, and you can you can get those books. They're still available out there, and um, if you want to pick those up, there's a whole series, and they're wonderful, and kids love them. There's a whole generation of kids that came up uh, reading Dinotopia, and it's it's probably going to inspire future James Gurneys in the world, and, and that's wonderful. I wanted to say to you about that, about your work, James, and as you think about um, you recently had a birthday, and it's a... You know, I think of it as a milestone, you know, birthday, all, all of them are when we get to a certain age. But I was wondering about what you want to leave the world. I mean, not not so much in the big grand scheme of a legacy or whatnot, but, but what do you hope people think about you when you're gone, James? What, what uh, it's kind of a morbid thought, but I just wanted to know what, what you want to leave the world behind. Have you done the things you wanted to do? Do you feel like you've had a full life? You know, those kind of things. Well, I'm doing the things I love doing the most, uh, which is writing books uh, and articles. I write an article for uh, uh, International Artist Magazine. Uh, but I want to leave behind some not only paintings and illustrations uh, and videos online, uh, but printed books. And I think that's why books I, I love so much. I, I grew up with Norman Rockwell's My Adventures uh, as an Illustrator and the book by Arthur Guptill about Rockwell's process. Rockwell was a huge hero of mine when I was growing up, and he took the time out from his later years to write down his process. And very few people did, um, you know, before mid mid twentieth century. Amazing how few of the, like Bouguereau and uh, Almatadema and people like that, of uh, the academic period, bothered to write anything down. So I, I feel a duty to kind of pass on what I've learned, uh, and in the process of writing that and, and working that out, to learning more and continuing to find out more about this amazing uh, process of making pictures, both of the imagination and of, uh, from observation. And I think for me, um, trying to join imagination and observation together is, is the challenge. Whether I'm doing a scene from the Mesozoic period of dinosaurs, I try to bring to that a sense that it's something you could actually eyewitness and give it a feeling of that of wildlife art or wildlife photography might have. And when I'm doing something from observation outdoors, I love to bring an element of imagination to that. And I think that's one of the big bridges that we all need to try to work on is yeah. to bridge between yeah. our imagination and our observation. And I think it's also important for me to to think of observational work not just as a commercial thing, because I think there's been a lot of emphasis on you know getting into galleries and selling your work. I think it really can be a personal mm -hmm. document that you can pass on to your family and that you can keep together uh, as a journal. And it, it doesn't doesn't have to be always commercialized. I think that's an, an important well, option for people to take. Art for the love Very of it, true. right? Imagination for the love of it. Remember when you were a kid and you could lose yourself 
in a completely different universe and how happy that made you feel. I know, I know for me, it was an escape, you know, from the harder times of life. And I loved being able to sit down and the fresh white page was a universe of possibilities for me. And I, I think yeah. some, in some ways, all artists feel that way when they look at the blank page or canvas. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just yeah, love I, you, the discovery. I can't say it any better than you. I think uh, for me, uh, art, uh, when I was young, I grew up in a very chaotic family where there was a lot of emotional storms around me. And I would go to my room and either do uh, lettering or drawing as my escape. And I think for a lot of people do art for all kinds of different motives. But when I was growing up, the kind of things I loved doing was uh, was to go and, and center myself by being in my room drawing. And I think it's important for every artist uh, as you get older to reconnect with who you were when you were 16 or 17 when you started realizing you loved drawing and painting and to connect with the same themes that you liked at that age because that's what's going to drive you through the rest of your life yeah yeah i love i love that I, that thought i love the idea of discovery that's kind of what did it for me I, I really don't even care about gallery work or prints much anymore it's just the idea of discovery and and being able to open turn on the light for somebody else you know who's also trying to discover the same things is is just just a world of motivation i think anyway yeah and i think it's the best time right now to be alive as an artist because uh you, there are so many new ways of making a living at it that didn't exist before um you know it used to be just freelance illustration and gallery work maybe and there were all kinds of gatekeepers you had to get through uh, but now with uh, with crowdsourced crowdfunding and uh, with digital downloads and, and all these different ways of Etsy and, and ways of selling directly to customers and um, creating uh, uh, videos for fun, the main thing is to keep, you know, 90% of it just to be for fun and experimentation. And the, the income hopefully will follow after that, but there's no guarantee. You know, if you just do it for fun and you're not worried about making a living at all, that's fine too. And there's a lot of uh, fabulous artists who just do it for the pure love of it. Well, this hour has absolutely flown by, uh, Mr. Gurney and Steve. And I wonder if James, yes. we could talk to you again, and maybe a year from now, can we catch up? And and um, I think we'll be fast friends by then. If we're not already, uh, we'd love to just get yes. get to know you and and share your thoughts with with the audience. Maybe check back in in a year from now or something yes sure that'd be fine I'd, I'd love to talk to you guys again and put you on uh, the spot really enjoyed your questions <laughs> yes and it's it's good having this three-way conversation <laughs> with you guys and i uh, hope we can do it again sometime well it's been wonderful yeah, it's, um, I, I, you'll go ahead steve i was going to mention gum road and the living sketchbook app and yeah please do please do Mark. yeah and, and 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 is there anything else you're working on right now james that you would like people to really take a look at yeah well, mainly, you know, the next Gumroad video will be called Color and Practice Part 2 on Triads. So that's what I'm doing right now. And um, and you can check out uh, Color and Light and Imaginative Realism on uh, Amazon or on, on jamesgurney.com. Uh, and uh, the Dinotopia books are still available in print. Although I don't know how much longer they will be because uh, Dover Books is in Chapter 11. So, so pu publishing is changing. Um, but... Uh, well, there's a special going on with your books right now. I think you're signing some, and there's some available if you, well, I snapped up a couple. I'm I'm sorry, James, I plug you, because they're signed. You hand-signed them. so. Yeah, the ones on my website are hand-signed, and I'm doing a whole bunch. I think I, they got mentioned on a, an online art school uh, as recommended books, so I got a yeah. whole flurry of orders, but I'm happy to do them for people. So I'm putting little special goodies in there for him, uh, and that's what I'll be going back to when when we finish this call. And well, if you, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned. I'm glad glad you mentioned color and practice uh, too. I, if you didn't, I was going to. Uh, I've watched the first one and uh, looking forward to the next one. It's a great extension of your color and light book, and especially for and my also audience. A couple of face. Oh, yes. And uh, for YouTube audiences overlap a fair amount. And I want to mention, too, that there's a couple of Facebook groups that are free to enter. And uh, there's quite a few people. One is called uh, Color and Practice. And that's for people who want to share their progress as self-teaching students. 
And the other one is called Sketch Easel Builders. And this is for people who are building their own lightweight easels to use outdoors. They mostly fit on camera tripods. A lot of builders who have a lot of tips who share them with each other. It's a wonderful community of, uh, of people building lightweight easels. Yeah, I think some of your dad's engineering rubbed off on you, James, because you make the most interesting stuff. And uh, and I watched all your videos on that stuff, and it's fascinating. So thank you for that. Um, Steve? Well, yeah, our time is at an end. And, man, this has been just absolutely great. I'm so glad you decided to take the time to do this with us. Uh, very, very motivating and inspiring. Loved uh, being able to ask you questions directly. Had a fantastic time talking with you today, James. Wish you the very best. Been a real honor. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good talking to you guys. And I'll, I'll hang up and talk to you again another time. All, All right. right. For Artist Bye -bye. Spotlight, this is Marty Owings. And I'm Steve Mitchell. So long for now. So long for now.